let's get some more formula practice. Okay, so we've got this money spent on food, money spent on clothing, and we are talking about writing a formula for total expenditure. Nothing difficult here. So uh, you could easily write equals B1 plus B2. But we could also very well write equals sum B1 colon B2. And a third alternative would be uh, to write sum B1 comma B2. Let's explore each of these. Okay, so equals B1 plus B2. Per perfectly correct, nothing to complain. Equals sum B1 colon B2. On the face of it, this looks like overkill, right? We've got only two uh, items. Why not just add them with B1 plus B2? Well, writing B1 plus B2 is fine, but writing sum B1 colon B2 has a very small advantage, right? When you have a range like this, suppose we've got money spent on food, money spent on clothing, and you've got total expenditure, and for some reason, you've got to insert something either between these two or just above money spent on food or just below money spent on clothing. In other words, we've got one more item of expenditure that we want to now add on to the spreadsheet. The beauty with using sum B1 colon B2, that is a range, is that the moment you add on one more item uh, which extends the range either by inserting in the middle or adding on top or adding on the bottom, Excel actually automatically changes the formula for you. So if you added one more item in between, it'll change this formula to sum B1 colon B3 automatically. And of course, since we inserted something, the total would have would go down uh, by one row. So that way, this writing sum B1 colon B2 is a little more uh, adaptable to changes that occur in spreadsheets. This brings up one very important consideration, that is that when you design a spreadsheet, you always have to be conscious of the fact that some change may occur to the spreadsheet. It's not as if you design the spreadsheet and that's completely final. Because usually you do something, it's a preliminary version, and then small changes keep happening to it. And a spreadsheet that is adaptable to change is very good. That's a very positive benefit and therefore uh, one would actually prefer to write it as sum B1 colon B2. Sum B1 comma B2, uh, that's really, uh, it doesn't really get us anywhere. You know, it doesn't, uh, might as well just write B1 plus B2, right? Because this is not giving us any great advantage, I won't write it. And of course, there's another option that I have not even mentioned here, which is a number of people would write sum B1 plus B2. Well, that is really pointless because when you say B1 plus B2, you've already added them up. And then what's the point in saying sum? Because you're really saying sum and you're providing just a single number. So that is fairly meaningless. So I would say the choice is between these two, the first two, and I would prefer the second option. It is actually very pointless to use the sum function without a range. Okay, so now uh, write a formula for cell B3. So once again, it's the same thing. What about writing equals 150? That certainly is correct. 100 plus 50 is certainly 150. And some people would do that. But this is a really dangerous approach to doing things because we are trying to use Excel because we want Excel to perform the computations. There's really no point in us performing the computation and using Excel like a word processor and just putting the results. Okay, that's one thing, which is that Excel is supposed to perform the computation and we are doing it. Uh, the other bigger problem with this is that, well, suppose you wrote 150 and it's correct for the moment, but just remember what I just mentioned, which is that things change when you create spreadsheets, right? In a very small spreadsheet, of course, you make this uh, 120. Immediately, you can see that the answer is 170. So you would not leave it at 150, but on a large spreadsheet, you don't know what changes in what places affect what other changes somewhere far away that's outside of your field of vision, right? So therefore, what you really want to do is to write formulas in such a way that any changes would automatically ripple through the spreadsheet. You don't want to perform the computation. You want Excel to perform the computation, right? Which is what I mentioned uh, at the start of the course, which is that the arithmetic we are using in this course is trivial. 
There's nothing complicated about the arithmetic. And the point is not to do something and get the correct answer. This is not a course in arithmetic. It's a course about learning correct Excel technique. Let's consider one more problem. So the first row gives us the number of miles I drive to work each day one way, the number of days I work in a week, and the number of working weeks in a year. So here we want to write a formula to compute the number of miles I drive per year for work. Okay. So of course you know that uh, we have said that uh, I drive 30 miles one day, uh, one way. So in a day I would drive two times 30 miles. Right, so it will be 2 times B1. The number of days I work in a week times, uh, that will be times B2. And the number of working weeks times times B3. So your formula would turn out to be 2 times B1 times B2 times B3. Okay, so in fact, this is not a complicated formula. But much of Excel uh, actually revolves around taking regular computations and translating that into Excel formulas. Again, I repeat, the idea is not to get the correct number here. The idea is to write the formula that would compute the correct number. Okay. So again, when you write a formula, you should write it in such a way that it's easy to think through this. So when you say 2 times B1, that gives you the miles per day, times B2 gives you the miles per week, and times B3 gives us the miles per year. Of course, we don't mention all of these. We just write the formula. But uh, it's easy to, or it's a, it's a good practice to just think through somewhat complicated formulas properly. Let's consider one problem here. It says pounds of raw material consumed overall. So in some manufacturing facility, 200 pounds of raw material were consumed overall. And from those 200 pounds of raw material, they made 1,000 units of whatever product they were making. So now we want to compute the raw material used per unit of products. Okay. So obviously we can reason out and say, well, they made 1,000 units and used up 200 uh, pounds. So per unit, it's basically the division that you do. So it's B2 divided by B1. Okay. So 1,000 units used up 200 uh, pounds. So one unit would use up 1,000 by 200 and that's the formula. Okay, so here we want to say uh, the average speed that a particular vehicle van you goes is 50 miles per hour and the vehicle made two trips. So one trip was 3,000 miles, another trip was 1,500 miles. Okay, and the hourly rate we pay for the driver is $20. Okay, so we're going to pay the driver for the number of hours the driver spent driving the vehicle. So we now want to calculate here the total amount that we now owe to the driver. Okay. So obviously the job is to compute the number of hours and then multiply it by the hourly rate. To compute the number of hours we need to find obviously the total distance divided by the speed and that will give us how many hours the driver was on the road and then multiply that. Okay. So the formula would turn out to be B4 which is the hourly rate divided by B2 divided by B1 plus B3 divided by B1, right? So B2 divided by B1 is the number of hours the driver spent on trip 1 and B3 by B1 is the number of hours the driver spent on trip 2, okay? So that would be the formula to do that. This is the hourly rate. This is the time for trip 1, time for trip 2. Uh, now, of course, there's another way to look at it. You could compute the total distance and then compute the time. In other words, you could say B2 plus B3 within parentheses divided by B1. That would be another way to, uh, to write the same formula. Of course, we have to keep in mind that this hourly rate is supposed to be multiplied by the total number of hours the driver spent. And the total number of hours is this plus this. And therefore, the parentheses play a very important role here to ensure that we first compute the total hours and then multiply it by the hourly rate. Okay, so now there is another kind of computation that you perform regularly uh, in Excel which is all kinds of percentage related uh, calculations. Okay, so here 
Let's say there is a company which earned $500,000 last year and this year has seen a 12% growth over last year. Okay, so given a base value, a percentage growth, you want to calculate the final value, right? So we want to find out what is the earning this year. Okay, so $500,000 was the earning last year. We are projecting a 12% increase in earnings. So what is the earning for this year? Okay, so obviously that's going to be uh, earnings for this year is five, you know, is an increase over last year. So obviously we'll have last year's earnings, that is 500,000. And then we'll have to add on 12% of 500,000. Okay, so the way to do that could be, uh, uh, you know, to do uh, the, to write the formula for uh, the 12% of 500,000. Uh, but before that, let's take a look at this point that Excel understands percentage notation, notation, right? So when you say this year's increase over last year is 12%, 12% is nothing but 0.12, right? So you could, this is a cell in which you could actually put the value 0.12 and uh, use the display characteristic and ask Excel to display it as a percentage, right? So in that case, it will display the value as 12%, but internally the value is actually just 0.12. Okay, so now let's take a look at the formula. It's going to be B1, which is the 500,000, the original value, because we said it's 500,000 plus the 12% increase, and this is the increase. The increase is B1 times B2, right? Because we said it's, you know, 0.12 is the factor. So 500,000 times 0.12, is just the increase part of it. So it's the original last year's value plus the increase. That's the total value. Okay. Often we also write it like this, B1 times 1 plus B2, right? which is nothing but B1 plus B1 star B2, but it's just uh, the writing uh, may seem a little more economical. Some people may prefer to see it this way. Some people may prefer to see it that way. Okay. So that's uh, percentage related computations. So this kind of computation occurs very frequently. That is, you're given a certain value and then you're given a percentage increase and you're supposed to calculate the final value. So the logic is this and this is how you would approach writing a formula for something like that. Another common computational requirement is the exact reverse of this. So take a look at the problem here. So this year, the figure was 400,000 let's say its earnings this year was 400,000 and this represented let's say a 16% increase over the last year's earnings. Okay, so remember in the previous problem we were given the last year's amount and then we said this is the percentage growth and we calculated this year's amount. Here we are given this year's amount and we are told that it's a certain percentage growth over the last year's amount which is what we need to compute. Okay, so effectively what we are saying is suppose the earnings last year was unknown x right x times 1.16 is 400,000 so what is x okay so instead of multiplying we will now be dividing and that's what we'll do so we'll say it's b1 divided by 1 plus b2 which is obviously going to be smaller than b1 right because it was something it grew by 16 percent and then it reached 400,000 so it's going to be a value less than 400,000 and uh, what value increased by 16% is going to yield 400,000, right? So you get that by using an approach like this, right? So you can easily think about this. You can say X, which is the earnings last year, times 1.16 equals 400,000. So X is nothing but 400,000 divided by 1.16. And that's exactly what we are doing here. So this again is a kind of computation that is often required in finance and in many other fields as well. Again, what we are doing in this particular uh, segment is just seeing lots of examples of how to write Excel formulas, which is uh, translating day-to-day -day computations expressed as computational requirements, or you can even think of it as word problems, converted into suitable Excel formulas. There's nothing difficult about this. If you can perform the computation arithmetically, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to write the Excel formulas, corresponding Excel formulas. But I'm just showing you several examples uh, so that you gain a little bit of practice 
in doing this. Okay, consider the following problem. Uh, let's say there was a worker to whom we had paid an advance of $2,200 and this worker had worked 50, 50 hours on one project, 65 hours on another project and we also paid an, a final settlement to the worker of $3,450. In other words, we paid the worker a total of $2,200 plus $3,450. That's the total amount which is $5,650. And this worker had worked uh, this many hours. Hours worked on project 1, hours worked on project 2, 115 hours. So now what we want to compute is given all of this data, what is this worker's hourly rate? Right. Again, there's nothing difficult. We know the total number of hours. We know the total amount that was paid. So it's nothing but the total amount that was paid divided by the total number of hours. That's the wage per hour. So converting that into a formula simply becomes B1 plus B4, which is the total money paid to the worker, divided by B2 plus B3, which is the number of hours the worker worked. Obviously, we have to be extremely careful to have the parentheses in the right places, right? Otherwise, you know that the division operator will have high priority. If you miss out the parentheses, it'll only divide B4 by B2 and B1 and B3 will not be included in the operations in the correct way, right? So that's the reason I included this example. Be very wary, be very careful of where you need to add parentheses. Another percentage problem. Let's say we know that the profit in the year 2016 was 17% higher than in the year 2015 write a formula for cell B2. Well, this is very similar to something we had already done. It's going to be A2 multiplied by 1 plus 1.17. Right? That's what it is. A2 multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.17. Uh, so this is very similar to what we had done earlier. In the earlier case, the number 0 0.17 was in a particular cell and we used the cell address. Here we are just putting the number directly in here. Okay, so you could also write actually A2 times 1 plus 17 percent instead of 0 0.17 because as I already told you, Excel understands the percentage notation. So when you say 17 percent, Excel will automatically internally divide it by 100 and use 0 0.17. Okay, uh, so A2 multiplied by 1 plus dash dash. Okay, now very important point, very very soon you will see that we don't like embedding such numbers directly inside of formulas. Of course, this one we can add because it's nothing but, you know, the distributive property by saying A2 plus A2 times 0 0.17. So we're just gathering the common A2 outside and putting the one. So this one is all right. But this 0 0.17 is one of the data that is given to us as part of the problem. And we are very, very wary. We don't like to include such numbers in formulas. Okay. Very soon, you'll see why we don't like it and also how we avoid doing that. We'll see that shortly. Okay. So here, I'm just illustrating formulas. So I've included it, but in a real problem, you wouldn't do it. Uh, and in fact, one of our guidelines as part of evaluating the course is if somebody does this, then they immediately fail the course no matter whatever else they may have done because it's such a big uh, uh, blunder to include an actual number inside a formula. Okay. Instead, what we'll actually do is to place this number in a particular cell and then use the address of the cell here. So for example, let's say we place this number in D1, right? Then we'll simply say A2 times 1 plus D1. Okay. So that, that's, the, that's the way we'll do it. We won't actually put the number directly inside the formula. 